I haven't done a hurling power rankings this year and pretty obvious at this stage that Limerick have to be number one. Don't think anyone's going to debate that so there's no point in focusing on it. They've been dominant. They've won the league, blip against Cork, but won the last two games by 38 points. Second place has to be tip at the moment because they've, um, they've brushed aside anyone in, in Munster so far. Cork by seven points in their home patch and then Hammer Watford and Clare in their home patch as well. If they beat Limerick, yeah, they can all of a sudden start thinking we can get up to number one spot. But there's a chance they'll meet them in the Munster final as well if Limerick win. And then further down the line too, if they have aspirations to win in All-Ireland. I've been worrying about Galway in the sense that, is anyone going to step up as a leader? And of course they did at the weekend, winning in Nolan Park, which if you have your full team out is a tough thing to do. So I think Galway have to go in at number three because... It's highly likely they'll at the very least get through to the All-Ireland Series uh, in third place in Leinster, if not the Leinster final and get in as Leinster champions. So he'll probably be back and they'll be more or less up to full strength again. Um, it was a tough one then between Kilkenny and Cork for the number four spot. I just about went for Kilkenny because if they have their full team out, which means Wally Walsh, who wasn't playing against Galway, Killian Buckley, James Maher, and even in, you know, in the sense of them being used as impact subs, there were two of those were on the bench the other day, Buckley and Maher, neither used. So with Kilkenny being under pressure, two men sent, two men sent off. If they were anyway right, they were going to be used. Uh, and as well, if Richie Hogan was in a position to start. Now, maybe he is and Cody just isn't using him at the moment. But with everyone firing, I just about go with Kilkenny. Even though Cork have won the last two Munster finals and they've been to the last two All-Ireland semi-finals, they've beaten Limerick this year. And they probably should have beaten Limerick in the All-Ireland semi-final last year as well. They have unbelievable scoring power as well. So in some ways I'm quite torn about that because this isn't the Kilkenny team of old. But they're just, they still have that never say die. So it's, it's very hard to back against them. And in a tight call, nearly always makes sense to go for them. Um, in sixth place then, I had to go for Wexford ahead of Dublin in seventh. The reason I went for Wexford is they should have beaten Galway. They had Dublin more or less beaten. But at the same time, Dublin were the better team for the guts of 55 minutes against Wexford. So it's not like that was an easy decision either. I don't think either team has the scoring power of the top, top teams. So that's why they're so far down the pecking order. If Wexford win in uh, against Kilkenny, then that changes everything. Same with Dublin beating Galway. And I mean, that's the beauty of this hurling championship. There are surprises there to be had. Galway winning Kilkenny was a big one to me. After that, I think Clare have been so, so poor. It's hard to have them higher than either Dublin or Wexford, even though I'm sure they'll be upset as ever. We know how quickly they get upset down there in Clare. But big players aren't performing. Probably have seven or eight really top players on the field. And after that, you're kind of plugging gaps um, to be beaten in the manner in which they've been beaten by Tipperary by 13 points, Limerick by 18 points. They've just fallen over and they haven't backed up anything that they did last year not that they won anything anyway um after that it's waterford nine and carlo 10. i mean you could make a case that carlo have a better scoring difference after their games than waterford do but i think if we're being realistic waterford have done far more over the years to even be in the same conversation and realistically waterford should be much higher up the list if they were performing to their maximum um tj reed or henry shefflin who it's a tough call like who is the who is Kilkenny, who is more of a Kilkenny great between the two, and it's something that I'm definitely torn on. So if I if you pick one over the other, that doesn't mean you rate the other. Like these are two absolute greats, so you know you're rating them both. But the thing about Shefflin is he led the team, and he was surrounded by a galaxy of stars. And but to be fair, he did lead them. He won her of the year three times and gave some unbelievable displays. That 2012 uh, drawn game against Galway is always one that comes to mind. Because of the second half, he did more or less lead them massively on his own when others didn't. So the th then the thing with TJ is he was brilliant while the team was very good. Now, the first couple of years he was in and out of the team, probably 2012 before he truly, truly became an established star. Whereas Shefflin probably in the team for a longer run of years. Still, TJ Reid's only 31, so he's in for a couple of years. But in the past couple of seasons, when Kilkenny haven't been as strong as they were, and he doesn't have the same support and cast around him. The stuff that TJ Reid has done has been unbelievable. His performance against Galway at Nolan Park and the defeat, even down as far as having 13 men, is very hard to think of anyone who's ever done anything quite like that. Um, so I think, and maybe it's recency bias, 
but just the things that TJ Reid has done in the last couple of years, you'd be starting to think just about him, but obviously Shefflin's unbelievable as well. It's a tough call, but uh, tell me what you think and, and who you think is better. It actually brings me to another discussion. At their height, this is something that's come up a few times, at their height, who was the, the greatest ever forward in the 21st century, we'll say, because the game has changed since then. So just to compare like with like-ish, who is the is the best forward of the 21st century? Um, I, one that I often hear from a, a Galway friend of mine is, who's better at their peak? Is it Owen Kelly or Henry Shevlin? And I suppose you can throw a TJ Reid into it as well. And there are many others. So let me know what you think anyway. Um, the likes of Kelly, of course, was in a tip team that was very poor at times and he was still kind of leading the charge on his own where Shefflin was, you know, running the show in an unbelievable team as well. And that's that's a huge thing too. So I find it very hard to, to decide, but let me know what you think. Um, Tipperary against Limerick on Sunday. I think it's going to be... I had a talk with someone the other day and they were saying most teams you can go after their leaders and if you go after the leaders and quieten them then the rest of the team is going to struggle to impose itself. But that Limerick have so many leaders that uh, it's a different conversation with them. You can't just shut down one or two and then the rest collapse around them. Uh, and that is the challenge for Tipperary because Tipperary are on the back of three brilliant wins. But that doesn't mean they're necessarily as good as Limerick all of a sudden, who of course have a better bench. But if Limerick had a couple of players that you were going to shut down, it would have to be Declan Hannon at centre-back, Keane Lynch at midfield. And Aaron Galland, the full forward line, and it's almost silly to even bring it up. It's so obvious, and the idea of just stopping it, if, I mean, it's easier said than done, obviously. But I think if you did stop those three players, there's a fair chance that a couple of the other Limerick players who look unbelievable mightn't be quite as good. Now, to be fair to the likes of Dermot Burns, even three seasons ago, I remember him giving an unbelievable display against Clare in a, possibly a quarter final uh, from wing back. The likes of him, he has done it before when the team hasn't been as good, and he's not the only one either. But uh, if those, if you were going after leaders, those would be the ones. And Liam Sheedy has definitely targeted that in the past couple of games. And if you look at who Michael Breen has been on, it's been against the guy who likes to make the team tick. So that was Jamie Barron against Waterford, and not only did Breen shut him out, but he got some scores as well. And Colin Galvin as well, he was all over him like a rash in that game in Cusick Park. So uh, it is very much going after the leaders, and it's the same at the other end for, for Limerick. They'll definitely be looking to close down Noel McGrath, and you'd imagine as well uh, Seamus Callan will be targeted. Um, and not for anything particularly rough, but they will be looking to close him out and have a man marker for him. Um, a big topic this week, of course, is the, uh, the Dublin funding. And John Horne, the GA president, came out talking about how a huge amount of it was to do with the voluntary coaching. And of course that stuff is important, but of course uh, you can't say the money hasn't have a, had a huge impact. Like for population, they've had more than twice than everyone else has had. So, I mean, that is a massive important. The more money, the better you can do. Um, but one of the things, the population is just, and the effect of the population, it's pretty obvious to say that the population has an impact. But if you have, like down in the country, and you might have 15 at training, the guy who's a bit of a luxury player doesn't necessarily want to try that hard. You're still going to have to rely on him. You're still going to have to play him. And there are times we all know that guy who doesn't have the greatest attitude in the world and other people get a bit disenfranchised because he's getting his game anyway. Whereas I've found and I've seen in Dublin that you'd have, at times, not every club, much bigger numbers at training. And when that happens, people with the bad attitude tend to get weeded out. And those that are there, they're all fighting with each other because there's such competition around them that it creates and it can do create a much better culture whereby there are so many people that are putting their hand up to be picked by the manager that invariably the guys with the bad attitude end up walking away because they're not going to do give the same levels of preparation so that allied with money you're looking at good cultures across the board both in clubs underage development squads and all the way up through the system and i think that population issue is something especially with rural depopulation is something that's absolutely huge so pouring more money on top of Dublin in on top of that I mean that's why the Leinster Football Championship is the way it is or a huge part of it actually speaking of Dublin um, the conversation around Dear McConnelly never seems to, to die down after every game Jim Ga or press appearance Jim Gavin has asked 
is Dear McConnelly coming back and he always leaves it open but I mean I, I don't think it's uh, it's exposing anything that isn't in the public domain anyway by pointing out that on Dear McConnelly's Instagram page he's like the weekend that they're playing the Leinster semi-final he's in Rome enjoying himself on a holiday so the idea that he'd be coming back this season just seems so far-fetched so it's probably time to stop, stop asking the question yes he's an unbelievable player he'd walk on to more or less any team in the country and a different manager would probably have him as his number one forward on the Dublin team right now obviously Gavin didn't start him the last season that he was there fully so um, yeah it's probably just time to stop that question